Hello everybody. Thank you very much for downloading this episode of We Love the Internet. Halfway through recording, I realised that being the absolute professional I am, I was recording the audio from my built-in shitty potato mic on my computer instead of my nice proper microphone. So about halfway through, there's a very subtle difference in the quality of my audio. So my deepest apologies for this, but I do feel like it's something of a rite of passage that you cock up the audio on the first episode of your podcast. So at least we can take that one off. So with that out of the way, on with the show. Welcome back to We Love the Internet. My name's Harrison. And I'm Chris. How are you doing today, Chris? I'm good, cheers. It's not uh, it's, it's getting a bit cold, but it's, it's all good. It's, it's February, so it's a lot bit warmer than I expect normally, but otherwise we're good. How about you? Yes, it's getting a bit chilly up here as well. I managed to escape under a blanket to do a little bit of Wikipedia research this afternoon, ah. which was most welcome with a nice fortifying cup of coffee. Nice. Uh, I, I fell down one hell of a Wikipedia rabbit hole oh, good. <laughs> researching this this topic. It was a uh, it, it took me to some funny places. So I think we're going to have some tangents on tangents on tangents as as per usual. Excellent. But, uh, Tell hopefully me all about it. Will be, well, okay. Uh, let's just get into it. I'm going to spoil it otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this week on the internet, I learnt that hippos have become an invasive species in Colombia, and it's all Pablo Escobar's fault. Uh, there's so much to take in in that one sentence. <laughs> I don't know where to begin. Okay. Um, well, let's start. Let's start with Pablo Escobar. How about? Sure. Okay. So, what do you know about Pablo Escobar? Uh, massive drug dealer in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, eighties. Uh, I think it was the ninety three, ninety four that he got caught somewhere around there. Sure. Well, he actually got he actually Gosh. got caught a couple times and managed to either escape from prison or negotiate his way out of prison. Yeah. Um, at, at one point, he offered to pay off uh, all of the country's national debt if they would stop him being extradited. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yes. So when when he died, he was worth around thirty billion dollars, which Holy in God. modern day terms is about fifty nine billion. Wow. And just just for reference, that's that's more than half what Bill Gates is worth <laughs> as as of the time of recording. <laughs> Holy crap! So and he he um, he was shipping heroin, wasn't he? To the uh, cocaine. States. Oh, cocaine. 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 Yes. Cocaine, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He was like the first big Colombian uh, drug cartel. Um, well, big being the appropriate word. Mm. Um, it's it, it's estimated that because basically all of his money was in cash, just kind of like kicking around, um, he lost about 10% every year from rats eating the money and mould getting into the money. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he was burying it or leaving or, or storing it in places whereby yeah, rats could get at it and they'll eat anything. Oh, yeah, exactly, yeah. And he, 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 they spent millions and millions of dollars every year just on elastic bands to hold all of his wads of cash together. <laughs> <laughs> millions of dollars on elastic bands. <laughs> <laughs> These are the kind of problems you have when you're running a thirty yeah. billion dollar drug yeah. empire. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> I wish I had those problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe, there maybe are worse problems actually. to have, I suppose, aren't there? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be shipping cocaine everywhere. I don't really want that problem. <laughs> so, um, basically, in his in his house he was living in in the eighties, he set up like a little private zoo for him and his family, um, which had all sorts of weird ass stuff in it. Um, including four hippos, and when the um, when do. the auth- well, yeah, we, why not? <laughs> You've got that rich, kind of money. Why not? Exactly. Yeah, uh, I want I want hippos. <laughs> exactly. So um, when the authorities came and uh, kicked them out of the house and mm-hmm. took everything, um, it was decided that the hippos were just too much of a pain in the ass to deal with. Basically, uh, so they they left them. They left them. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, from the early 80s to now, those four hippos have turned into 80 hippos. <laughs> so they just left, sorry, can we just roll back here a second? They left them in the properties. I mean, I mentioned yes. it's a big property. And obviously- yeah, yeah, well, well basically the, the authorities came in and they took out like the giraffes and all of the easy to move <laughs> animals. And they looked at these four massive hippos and they thought, you know what? That's not my problem. <laughs> going to leave those there <laughs> somebody else can deal with that well hippos are really dangerous aren't they well yes they are absolutely really freaking dangerous uh, which is what people in um, colombia are discovering um <laughs> in 2009 uh, two adults and one calf escaped from the herd that had been uh, bred since escobar's death and they started attacking humans and killing cattle oh and God. one of them uh, was killed by hunters under authorization from the local authorities um it's estimated that the population is likely to more than double in the next decade, uh, with one expert saying in the next couple of decades there could be thousands of them. And quite helpfully, he said, this study suggests that there is some urgency to deciding what to do about them. The question is, what should that be? <laughs> so obviously <laughs> because, they're an invasive species to, to Well, Columbia. yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're and, not <laughs> Well, no, no. And it, it turns out the main, the main problem people are arguing about 
uh, is that the hippo poop is fertilizing harmful algae and bacteria. Um, but the counter argument is that cons conservationists and locals, particularly people in tourism, uh, quite want them to stay because they think they're quite, quite interesting. <laughs> For the tourists to come look at. Exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, this is stunning. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> so this, <laughs> this, this mostly came from a uh, CNET article that I found uh, through uh, R Science uh -huh. um, with a study uh, done by some uh, American professors talking about what to do about them. Uh, there was also apparently a National Geographic Channel uh, documentary called Cocaine Hippos, <laughs> which uh, told the story. <laughs> and um, yeah, as, as you say, they are actually particularly freaking dangerous things. Yeah. Um, there's lots of stories in Africa and places of them like capsizing boats, attacking people, uh, and they're, they're considered one of the most dangerous animals in the world because they're highly aggressive and unpredictable. Um, <laughs> so, oh, and, and this is interesting. Um, th they are the third largest type of land mammal in the world mm -hmm. after the elephant and the rhino. Big, and big, big, big boys then. Well, yeah, they are. They are big, big boys. And their closest living relatives are cetaceans, so whales and dolphins, etc. Really? Yeah, that's and they, they diverged from them about 55 million years ago, but that's the kind of scale of animal we're talking about here. Yeah, and and I guess they spend a lot of their time in water as well, don't they? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, they tend to get territorial, um, <laughs> and they, they do almost all of their kind of like breeding and birthing and sleeping and everything in waters. Mm. Um, and apparently one of the most common reasons that people get attacked by them is when they're um, paddling through a, some water without looking what they're doing. And uh, they hit a sleeping rhino on the head with an oar. And then the, the rhino wakes up and is not best pleased. <laughs> as, as you can imagine. <laughs> Absolutely, hippo, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, you could, yeah because they, they can, I guess they're a bit like crocodiles. They can sort of, most of their body is under the water. Yeah, exactly, yeah. They're, they're, they're designed to not really be able to be seen mm. when, they're, when they're sleeping in the water. So you, you stumble across one by accident and you, you really wish you didn't. Let's mm. put it that way. The angriest veggies on the planet. So this this then led me down one of my many Wikipedia rabbit holes. Um, <laughs> the first zoo hippo in modern history was, of course, London Zoo, because we, mm -hmm. we stole everything from around the empire and brought well, it back. You know. uh, he, he was a, a hippo called, and I'm never going to pronounce this correctly, uh, Obayash, Obayash, oh, right. O-B-A-Y-S-C-H. Oh. When did they, they take him back to the UK? Uh, he arrived in London Zoo on the 25th of May in 1850, Oh. And it's estimated that he attracted up to 10,000 people a day wow. because he was such a unique beast. And uh, like, can you imagine the logistics of getting him back to the well, end? <laughs> wow. Yes. No, such I don't an angry they animal. <laughs> I think they probably got him over. You know what? Let's just leave him there. That's fine. <laughs> 10,000 so, people a day. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. He was very popular. Uh, he inspired a song called the Hippopotamus Polka, um, which then... Uh, led to a tradition of hippos being mentioned in novelty songs. Uh, there was a Christmas song, I Want a Hippopotamus for Christmas. Oh, I uh, didn't miss that a, one. A hit for the child star, Gayla Peavy, apparently. Mm. Uh, and they also featured in some Flanders and Swan songs, uh, the Hippopotamus and Hippo Encore, where they got the famous refrain, Mud, Mud, Glorious Mud. <laughs> and they also, of course, inspired Hungry Hungry Hippos, which led oh, me down really? a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, I don't know if you've ever played Hungry Hungry Hippos. I have Chris. when I was, a, I was a child, absolutely. Yes, yeah, yeah. A when classic, a younger. classic. Well, did you know that the hippos have names in Hungry Hungry Hippos? No, I, thought, I know they're different colours generally, aren't yes. they? Yes. No, I didn't so know the names. The original version had purple, orange, green, and yellow. Uh, the purple was Lizzie Hippo, the orange was Henry Hippo, the green was Homer Hippo, and the yellow was Harry Hippo. Uh, but unfortunately, a later edition replaced the purple hippo Lizzie with a pink one named Happy. Oh. So there we Poor go. Lizzie. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know if you, I don't know if you remember, but there was a bit of a, a craze recently for turning board games into movies. And incredibly, in 2012, a film studio confirmed that they were working on an animated film <laughs> adaption of Hungry Hungry Hippos, <laughs> uh, as well as Monopoly and Action Man. Uh, but unfortunately, no plot information was released, and so far, mercifully, it's been <laughs> quite quiet. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't imagine that would be a particularly good movie. No, I, I don't think there's a lot of plot available there. <laughs> no. So back to the names of the hippos, the hungry, hungry hippos. Yes, yes. Um, are they are they actually called names even now? If you play the game now, like we're going about a new copy. Well, I, I believe so. Yes. Wow. Uh, so Lizzie, the purple one, has been replaced by pink ones. So the colours are orange, green, yellow, and pink. Uh, mm -hmm. Apparently, in the official versions, I think there's some knockoffs out there as well. But yes, uh, as far as I know, they're still Henry, Homer, Harry, and Lizzie. Incredible. 
Yeah, yeah. So going back from the hippos, I then started looking into other exotic pets. And um, apparently wildlife smuggling for exotic pets is quite a profitable business. Mm. The industry generates roughly, well, no one knows for sure, but they reckon it could be anywhere from 7 to 23 billion US dollars every year. Wow. And this is according to Wikipedia. Um, and then it's a quite common uh, fact that there are more tigers in America in captivity than there are wild in the world at this point. Yeah, I've seen various documentaries where people have like tigers and um, other sort of like chimpanzees and things in, in their in their back gardens, like massive cages. But yes. obviously it's mad. That's loud. Yeah, yeah. Well, apparently um, America being the slightly unusual place that it is, uh, <laughs> the, the exact legality of it varies from state to state. Oh. Um, so there was an article in the National Geographic um, where they were talking about this. Uh, some states ban private ownership. Others require you to have a permit. Four have no laws at all. And in some places, it's easier to buy a tiger than to adopt a kitten from a local animal shelter. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can expect, that very often goes very badly wrong because as you say, yeah. some of them are just kept in very definitely not suitable for the job cages and so Completely. forth. Completely. And, and, and uh, you know, in a tiny space and not, not in their home environment, or in the, you know, yes. not in the wild, etc., etc. Exactly, yes. And if you let them get a bit hungry, some of their base instincts kick mm-hmm. in. They've been situations where they've, they've literally ripped people's arms off. Yeah, uh, by reaching through cages and so forth, and the people have died of blood loss while the tigers have been gnawing down on their arms. Oh, if they're hungry, I suppose they're gnawing anything. Oh, bloody well, hell! Well, yeah, quite. Yes. Um. So then, then I found a fantastic article because I, I wondered what kind of weird pets uh, go on in the UK, uh, and this is from a website called the House Shop, and uh-huh. these these are fifteen of the white weirdest pets that you can actually own. Um, so there's things like African pygmy hedgehogs, which granted are pretty cute, uh, pygmy goats, and then there's the micro pig. Are you familiar <laughs> with, with micro pigs? I've heard the term micro pig before, I've never seen one. So basically this was a fad um, probably about 10 years or so ago. They were also known as teacup pigs because um, <laughs> you could get one that would fit in a teacup. Well, um, teeny tiny tit pigs. Yes, exactly. The, the problem is um, the vast majority of people who were sold a teacup pig were in fact just sold a pig because piglets <laughs> are quite small. Uh, but then they, they just they just carry on growing. <laughs> when, when they're Do piglets, your research. <laughs> well, well, the problem is um, when they're piglets, they're basically impossible to tell apart. Uh, and the domesticated mini pigs, uh, according to this Wikipedia article I found, can vary from 25 kilograms to 100 kilograms once they're fully grown. <laughs> <laughs> and it has some fantastic advice here. If you want to try and work out how big they're going to grow, uh, it recommends trying to look at the pig's parents or grandparents, if possible, which is really, yeah. really helpful. Absolutely. You're not, you're not going to be showing them if, you, if you're thinking you're buying a micro pig and you're not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I found an article on um, Petter's website about why no one should buy a teacup pig. <laughs> And it um, it told the tale of Esther the Wonder Pig, who I found on Instagram, uh, who owners believe they were buying a teacup pig. And in fact, they were just buying an enormous pig. <laughs> but but th- thankfully, Esther's owners still love her, even though she oh, is a full size pig. That's um, good. So she's she's living a happy life. Um, but they, it turns out that one of the mini pigs, as they call them, uh, I'm going to again butcher the pronunciation here, uh, Gotten Gen mini pig, I think. Mm. Um which I was looking at the picture and it looked really sweet. Uh, but then it turns out that it was raised for use in biomedical research. Because oh. sm- smaller pigs require less space and feed, were easier to handle and required a lesser amount of compound being tested. So uh, that's a lovely end to that little bit there. Yeah. <laughs> and then finally, I found this incredible list um, on a website called Detector. Uh, 10 unusual pets you can own. So you just let me know if any of these sound tempting for you. Uh, there's a fennec fox, which looks like a cross between a fox and a cat. Um, and, and I know your attitudes towards animals are less than loving, shall we say. So. Well, less than, I mean, I don't really want one. Let's put it that way. I mean, I'd love to look at them from a distance if somebody else is walking a dog or something. But no, yeah. Okay, not, okay. Not really well, basically, fun. basically, if I was going to buy you one of these 10, you just let me know which one uh, you, sure, you, you yeah, prefer. Sure, yeah, I'll shout it out. Uh, then there's the capybara. Are you familiar with the capybara? I've heard the term. Well, they've heard the name. Of the, no, I'm not, no, I don't know what it is. No, uh, I, I believe I believe these are residents in. I've seen them in Australia. Yeah. Um, they're basically like a, kind of looks like a guinea pig or a or a rat or a hamster maybe. Um, but they can grow up to four feet long. 
and uh, sometimes weigh up to a hundred pounds. That's one very large guinea pig. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> apparently, they're very high maintenance, and they do need lots of room and a pond. <laughs> I bear that in mind if I'm looking to buy one. Okay, okay. So we're probably not going to go for a capybara. Yeah, we should you. move up past the capybara. Uh, okay. Yeah, how, yeah. how how do you feel about donkeys? Um. Not 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 the greatest fan of donkeys, I have to no, say. No, how about a miniature donkey? Miniature <laughs> donkey. Of course, there's a miniature donkey. Of yes, there is. Uh, they're they're usually around about three feet tall. Um, so that's you know it's quite cute. Uh, but mm. the problem is you do have to buy them in pairs because they do get very lonely if they're oh, if they're ever bought on their own. Donkey, don't want that to happen. Yeah, no. Still uh, two of them. The the regular hedgehog would that would that tempt you at all? Mm, yeah, they feel very quiet. Just do their own thing. Snuff around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hibernation. Yeah. When I when I was younger, um, we had a, a a hedgehog that used to come into our garden every morning. I used to go mm. in and feed it, and I considered it my pet um, until one morning I came into the garden and it was floating in the pond. Oh, so, God! <laughs> quite quite a traumatic experience, really. That's quite a terrible. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you when that happened? Uh, probably like eight, <laughs> eight or nine. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't that wasn't a happy morning. <laughs> There's the uh, the spotted gannet. Um, What's a spotted gannet? Is it different it, to a normal gannet? Well, they, they describe it on this website as looking like a cross between a ferret, a cat, and a raccoon. A ferret, a cat, and a raccoon? Yeah, it just mm. it, it looks weird, what? to be honest. I, I don't think I'd gannet. recommend it. No. Um, so we've ruled out a donkey. How about a goat? <laughs> oh, no. I've had... No. Definitely <laughs> not a goat. I've had a terrible incident with a goat. No. Well, what was your terrible incident with a goat? <laughs> so I was travelling with some mates around sort of Cambodia, Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Vietnam, a couple of different places. We went on to an island one day. It was an organised tour. We went on to the island. It was for the day. Um, beautiful, beautiful place, like crystal clear waters and a uh, bar on the beach and the rest of it. You know, a couple of mates. Great. So I sit down in this uh, chair, a few chairs, sit down in a chair, and this donkey, oh, not donkey, I've got donkey on the mind, this, this goat, it was huge, um, wanders over uh, and then starts taking a serious um, dislike to me. Nobody else, like five or six of us standing in this group, <laughs> oh, I was sitting on a chair or something, I don't know, maybe I was sitting in this chair, who knows what I was doing. It did not like me. It started butting me with its, th- with its head, um, and this was one big goat. I mean, it, it didn't mack around with it. And so <laughs> I was like trying to stop the goat from hitting me with its head. And it was it was failing really quite badly, uh, and it was getting harder and harder. It was getting more agitated with me, and I was obviously I was, I was moving away from the damn thing. It was following me, um, and then I think one of the people on obviously this happened to lots of people. It must have done this bloody goat, and then so that somebody from the bar wanders over with like a spray, uh, like water spray in you know in a sort of in a bottle, and just sprays it in the cats, face. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, same thing. Spray, and sprayed it in the face, and it sort of it wandered off as far as I remember, and then I wandered I pretty quickly as well. I wandered I pretty much stalked away from the damn thing. But no, nobody else had a problem. We had nobody else had a problem with it. That just hated me. Just zeroed in on you. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why I'm so lovely. Well, apparently, uh, you can also if you if you want to keep a goat but you don't have space for a full size goat, you can also get pygmy goats. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, much like the miniature donkeys, they do get lonely, so you'd have to oh, get a couple. I wouldn't want um, one, to be honest with you. Well, the, the good news is that apparently you also have to have very sturdy walls and uh, fences up because they can quite easily escape. So <laughs> it would be pretty easy for you to get rid of it if you decided you didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some pygmy goats wandering up down the road. <laughs> and then there's a thing called a sugar glider, which looks frankly terrifying. <laughs> um, you know those little, uh, little toys with the massive eyes? Yeah. It looks it looks basically like one of those. Um, apparently, they're they're known as pocket pets uh, because they're very cuddly and tiny, uh, incredibly playful and loyal, and can be taught tricks. But frankly, it looks so freaking terrifying. I don't think I'd want to teach it <laughs> tricks. And then then we get on to the three that I really question on this list. Um, Do you not question the other things on this list? <laughs> oh yeah, no no no. It gets worse. It gets worse. <laughs> uh, how would you feel about a tarantula? Oh no no. I, I mean. You know, obviously, live in this country, live in the UK. We don't have big spiders necessarily, but I don't no. really like spiders anyway. But a tarantula, I know they're not um, poisonous to humans, but no, Ooh, those legs and the hair. And the, oh, no. Well, the, yeah, the, the, this website does does mention that um, they they do make great pets. Um, however, they do feed on live insects, so not a good pet for the squeamish. <laughs> Would you put it in the same cage, like some flies in the cage with it? Oh, my God. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. And then, and, then, and then next up is a boa constrictor. Oh. Uh, how, how are you with snakes? Um, I'm all right with snakes, actually. Oh, really? Okay, well, this this is probably the one, then. 
Yeah, but, <laughs> but aren't boa constrictors really dangerous? They can just sort of coil around you and suffocate you. Well, according to this website, they are much friendlier than any other snake. I'm not sure if that's damning with faint praise or not. <laughs> of the snakes, apparently they're the most friendly ones. Uh, they are amazing and quite safe animals to have as pets. Oh. Um, but their huge problem is their size. Yes, they grow so huge, don't they? They do grow very big, yes. Yeah. So they, it does recommend before buying one, make sure you have plenty of space. Um, but I've, I've saved what I think is the best, the best till last. Um, and I, I don't know who wrote this list. I don't know what they were thinking. But um, this option is a skunk. What? A skunk? <laughs> yes, yeah, apparently. <laughs> apparently people do keep skunks as pets. A skunk as a pet? <laughs> Um, so apparently, uh, <laughs> they, they do recommend removing their scent glands. Oh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, but they, they, they do promise that a skunk will make an excellent pet. Um, although apparently, um, you do need to make sure that you want one because once you remove their, their scent gland, they can't be released into the wild. No, um, obviously so, the way their defense is gone. Yes. So you, you rather commit to the skunk at that point. <laughs> You and the skunk have partners for life. Yes, yes. I wonder what it's uh, like to own a skunk. How strange know. is that? I mean, I guess it, it basically looks like a, a kind of a smaller badger or, or like a fat <laughs> ferret. <laughs> Both those things are you really wouldn't want in your life. No, no. I, I can only imagine the grooming involved. It's got a heck of a tail on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Well, well, that's a list of horrifying animals. Yes. Okay. So, so, so we've settled on the uh, on the boa constrictor for you from that well, list. Is, is that, is if that I had to choice? have one of those horrendous list of animals, then yeah, the boa constrictor is the one I think. <laughs> I have to admit that wasn't what I was expecting you to go for. But, uh, okay, fine. Well, I'll, I'll order you a boa constrictor right now. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> I'm not sure what else on that list I would really want to honestly. with you. I mean, it all sounds like the pig. Maybe the pigs are quite intelligent. But then if you get if you get one thing, you're expecting to be a micro pig and turns into a normal size pig into 100 kilograms mm. worth of normal pig <laughs> <laughs> not really what you want is it it can ruin your diet no, somewhat no no well there is that um famous churchill quote about pigs how um dogs look up to us cats look down on us and pigs treat us as equals <laughs> i think that's probably fairly wrong. accurate <laughs> so yeah so there we go I got, uh, so from pablo escobar to hippos to to skunks as pets. <laughs> wow, I, that, I don't, don't. I have an animal th- animal themed uh, thing for you, but I don't have anything quite like that. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's 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 hear it. Okay. So this week on the internet, I learnt where the largest population of camels lives in the world. Where do you think it is? <sighs> well, I'm guessing it's not going to be the obvious answer. Somewhere no. like um, Middle East or somewhere like that. No, no. You would expect it to be like Sahara Desert or something, wouldn't you? But no, it's yeah. not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in that case, I'm going to guess Norway. <laughs> Not quite. A bit further south, I have to say. Okay, a little further south. A little bit, okay. A bit. Um, okay, so it's actually Australia. Australia? Yeah, they have the biggest population of wild cat or um, feral camels in the world. Large, yeah, in the whole world. No, I would never have guessed that. No. Neither did I until I started looking at it. So how um, did that happen? Well, so before I tell you how it happened, let me let me give you some background on on, on the size of Australia. Uh, Australia is obviously absolutely massive. It's it's 7.2, 7, sorry, 7.2, 7.6 million kilometers squared so that's i mean that's obviously you can't even imagine how big that is it's absolutely massive um it's actually the sixth largest country in the world after russia canada china the us and brazil yes yeah, so it's pretty big um it's actually also uh, the smallest continental landmass, whilst also being the largest the world's largest island Say that in a couple of times and Jeez. rolls off the tongue. <laughs> so yes, largest continent, smallest. Uh, no, oh God, I've got this running away. Smallest <laughs> continent, largest island. In what did world. I tell you about drinking before the podcast? I know, I, I can't help it. I just got to completely mad. It's so nerve wracking. <laughs> <laughs> And in the central desert regions of Australia, the temperatures can climb to about, on average, 40 plus degrees C. So that's 104 degrees Fahrenheit, Yikes. which is pretty goddamn hot. Yeah. And um, just to round out the facts about Australia, uh, the annual average yearly rainfall is just 165 millimetres. Now, that might sound like quite a lot, but compared to the average in the UK, which is 1,154, it's uh, about seven times larger in the UK. So, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty pretty dry over there. Yes, and I'm presuming there's um, vast amounts that bring that number right down where they just get no rain whatsoever. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, like you say, the central regions of the uh, country where it's even even drier. So, yeah, that's, that's obviously the average rainfall of the whole country. <laughs> um, Yikes. 
years. So nice and dry. So well suited to camels, you might imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, but obviously, uh, Australia is well known for its uh, for its for its incredible amount of deadly species of wildlife. The, the types of things that want to kill you, but not really camels. I mean, <laughs> kangaroos, but not, again, not camels. And obviously, camels are not native to Australia. They were actually imported to the country when when the country was being opened up by the British. Across, you know, they were trying to obviously find out what was in in the internals of the land and where they could go and uh, sort of settle and build new towns, what have you. They brought camels in, and the first recorded camel arrived in Port Adelaide in South Australia on the twelfth of October, eighteen forty. So wow. actually, it's a bit, a bit like uh, your, your. I'm not going to try and remember his name, but a bit like your, uh, your hippo, the hippo came, yeah, to the, yeah. like, came to London Zoo. <laughs> I, can, I can only imagine the, the, uh, as you say, the, the, the requirements to ship a camel, and like I don't know what I don't know what I'd rather ship a camel or a hippo, but I, I wouldn't want either really. <laughs> no, indeed, I've got actually a little story about that in a second about shipping the, the first one, one of the first camels, not the first I'll one, but yeah, the first one came in on the twelfth of October, eighteen forty, and it came. Um, it was the only one to survive the trip from Tenerife um, all the way to Australia, oh, and he <laughs> was actually named Harry. Ah, a good, a good strong name. Yeah, absolutely, Harry the <laughs> Harry the camel, and he um, apparently had a very nasty temperament, and he was prone to biting people and other animals. <laughs> would you believe? So yeah, so so he was brought in, and he spent about six years. I'm guessing in a field somewhere. I don't really know. It wasn't really explained what happened to him for those six years between 1840 and 1846. But he he was like, he must have probably been uh, maybe not ten thousand people a day came to look at him. But he he um he was kind of sitting around the field enjoying himself, biting other animals and people if they got too close. Close. And then along came um, John Ainsworth Hor- Horrocks. Now he was an explorer uh, who wanted to go and um, check out Australia, see what was in the internal parts of the country. And he decided that um, taking a camel with him would be a great idea. He could load him up with all the stuff they need to take, and off they go on their trip. Now they're obviously um, wandering along um, in the outback somewhere, uh, trying to you know work out what's out there and, and, and document everything. And his scout, his Aboriginal scout, came back um, t- towards them and said, um, "Mr. Mr. Horrocks, I can see a beautiful bird up ahead. Um, do you want to shoot it?" <laughs> now, <laughs> clearly, the first you thing you think. Yeah, yeah, you might think back in those days you might want to draw it perhaps, or but no, uh, we want to shoot it. So, so nice. he thought this was a great idea. Horrocks did. So he uh, basically um, got Harry down on his on his knees, I suppose, not quite on his knees, but yeah, down, got him down so he wasn't going to wander it off anywhere, so he could access the packs and everything else on on Harry's back. Got out his his gun and started um, loading it and what have you. And as he was doing this, as he sort of had, as he was sort of rabbing home the shot in his gun, uh, Harry, I guess, lurched um, on his on his. Uh, um, on his hinds, on his hind legs. I don't know, as, as camels sometimes do, obviously, to get more yeah. comfortable. I suppose when he's sitting down, he lurched and he actually hit. He hit Horrocks's gun, which set it off, which which fired it basically. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately for um, Horrocks, he had his middle finger on one of his hands over the end of the barrel because obviously oh, no. he was trying to force the the shot down or whatever he was trying to do yeah. at the time, and it was pointed up at his face as well. So. Horrocks got horrendous injuries from this um, accident. It, it the, the gun discharged. Um, it took off his middle finger, Ooh. and also it um, took out a row of his teeth. I don't know Ooh. if it was the top row of his teeth or his bottom row. I'm guessing it was his bottom row. I don't know, but you can imagine now in the middle of the outback somewhere, um, this horrendous accident's happened. Uh, that's, yeah, that's going to sting. Yeah, absolutely awful um so what they decided to do was obviously not try and shoot the bird anymore um not or carry on with the expedition so they, they took horrocks um the party took horrocks to a sort of nearby station and um, to try and uh, help him out and it took obviously a number of days to get there first of all and then they obviously had to go and send off for a doctor which they did and uh, the doctor came back and tried to treat him but it's 1846, you know. Yeah. He's got very horrendous injury, injuries. I guess all they could really do for him was pain relief. I don't, I don't, can't really tell what what happened. I was going to say that must, that must have been an incredible amount of pain and not yeah. really anything to do about it. No, absolutely. Can you imagine? I mean, oh, oh yeah, oh. milk of the poppy. <laughs> I suspect back in those days, but yeah. you wouldn't have had any on him. I wouldn't have thought. Um, but he took 23 days to die oh. from an untreatable infection. So Jesus. not only did he have this horrendous injury and the pain that goes with that 23 days later he was dead so not a nice days 23 of, days either no not at all Oof. um 
so as he was sort of dying, um, he had one last um, one last request of the Aboriginal stockman, where the station he was sort of staying in, and it, the request was to um, make sure Harry was put down, shoot Harry, basically. Because <laughs> I don't think I can blame him. <laughs> no, going to be pretty bitter at this point, aren't you? I mean, you, you must have been told by the doctor, there's nothing we could do for you, and the amount of pain he was in. I, I can understand him making the request. Yeah, I um, think my request would be to kill that bastard. <laughs> I reckon so. So <laughs> Harry um, was duly taken outside, um, but before he could be shot, the average average stockman obviously leading him out there, um, and, and Harry being Harry, he decided to um, take a bite of one of the stockman's heads. Ooh. Now, <laughs> that's his head. So can you, can you imagine Jeez. how big this goddamn animal was <laughs> to, to bite somebody's head? So yeah, so then they obviously got bitten, and then they they put him down. So that was Ooh. Harry's lot. Yeah. And also Horrocks' lot as well. Um, Crikey. But yeah, so, so between, then between 1841 and 1859, they, the Australians imported a lot more camels. They're not quite sure how many, uh, but, but a number were imported. Um, and obviously, for opening up the com- country, obviously, to, to explore, to, to take supplies out to the new towns that are being formed for mining. Because obviously, the, the animals are excellent to get across um, the kind of, of environment and uh, the, the things that are in, you know, out there. You know, they don't need much water. Water, they can travel vast distances, and they, they can, you know, they can carry a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, they seem they seem suited to the environment, absolutely. Completely. So between 1860 and 1907, they think that about 20,000 camels were imported. So wowzers. Yeah, that's quite a few, isn't it? <laughs> on average, that's about 425 a year. I was going to say, I'm, I'm assuming that's not on one ship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you imagine that'd be one hell of a ship, wouldn't it? <laughs> No, <laughs> not just one ship. Uh, but yeah, over 47 years, 425 of them were brought in on average. So obviously some more, one year, a few years, you know, a few less than. I'd imagine yeah. probably they bred in, in country as well. Um, but yeah, 20,000 being imported. Um, and again, for, for exploration, for, for for the gold fields, for all sorts of different tasks. Yeah. Um, and a bit like Harry, male camels were mostly brought in because they were sort of suited to this kind of work. Obviously, they were females as well, but the, the male camels um, could carry up to 600 kilograms of weight. Now, Jesus. Yeah, that's a lot of weight. You may not know quite what that means in reality, but that's essentially um, almost as heavy as a cow. That's 0. 0.8, almost 0. 0.9 times the amount of a cow. So you're pretty much <laughs> talking a cow there that it can, that it can carry around on its back. 0. 0. 0.9 of a cow or yeah. six or six fully grown pigs. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine six fully grown pigs strapped to a camel? I'm sure there'd be legislation against that. That's not allowed. That can't be allowed. It'd be funny, uh, though. <laughs> somebody's down, bound to have done on Instagram. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure. Yeah, so uh, male camels, very tetchy, very, very capable of pulling uh, or carrying huge amounts of load. So 1930 rolled around um, at this point, And obviously you've got, you know, you've got many, many thousands of camels in the uh, in the country at this point. But because of, obviously, the increases in the capabilities of the motor vehicle and roads and, and trucks and things, they'd essentially put themselves out of business because they'd open up the country and, and, and the Australians had built roads to the places they need to build roads to. So they were kind of made redundant, really. Um, and at this point, what do you do with redundant camels? I'll tell you what the Australians did with redundant camels. They, they, they killed a few of them, but not many. <laughs> <laughs> what they thought they would do is, let's just release them out of the outback, mate. You know, it's fine. Yeah. That seems they're, they're, fine. Obviously, they're going to die. It's fine. Yeah, sounds like Pablo Escobar's hippos. Yeah, exactly. Same sort of thing. <laughs> Can't be asked to deal with that problem. They're really big. They're quite angry. Not going to get too close. Going to have to deal with the body if I kill it. Let's just set them off into the wild. So that's what they did. <laughs> <laughs> someone else's problem. They can yeah, so, somebody else can deal with that later on. That's not yeah. my problem anymore. Kick it, kick think, it down the road. Let someone else <laughs> straight kick, kick the can down the road. Absolutely. <laughs> the, the grand addition of all, of all the... All the the things that humans do yeah, um, yeah. so that's what they did they, they, they basically released them set them off into the outback thought they were going to die but you know camels arid deserts they're kind of very good at dealing with that kind of situation aren't they kind of environment yeah so they didn't die <laughs> They, they very much didn't die. So <laughs> we, we don't know how many started, you know, when they were releasing them, how many were out there. But like I say, between 1860 and 1907, 20,000 camels came in. So there will be some breeding happening during that time as well. You know, we've got a lot yeah. of camels out there. So they, they, they were let, let, let off. And now there's believed to be, now obviously these are estimates by the Australian government, um, and we can't, nobody can tell for sure, because obviously this is talking at such vast distances in the Australian outback, and, and not very many people live out there either, obviously. No. But they believe there's between 1 and 1.2 million camels now living in the outback holy shit just one or two isn't it (laughs) yikes yeah (laughs) cut cut the packs 
out of, of, of 20,000. So they breed quite well. But yeah, as I say, it's difficult to get a number, an accurate number, because they obviously live in remote areas. People don't live out there. It's, they they rely on the pastoralists, the farmers, to actually count them. But obviously, you know, they can only do so too much. So much. Yeah. And the, the reason they're actually becoming... Um, they're actually being classed as an invasive pest now. A bit like the hippos, actually. Exactly the same sort of situation. <laughs> Slightly different scale, though. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, there aren't a million. Although you never know in the future, those hippos. Oh, <laughs> they yeah. can keep breeding. Yeah. They might have the same problem on their hands. Give it 30 years or whatever. Um, oh, but anyway, so yeah, these, these camels, um, they can they do cause serious problems for the pastoralists, for the for the farmers um, in the outback. Because obviously they are competing with the, with the sheep and the cows for water and for food um, and so camels can go up to a week these camels in australia can go up to a, roughly a week and um, with little or no food Jeez. and they can lose a quarter of their body weight and um, without impairing any normal function of their body which is quite incredible <laughs> Good um, Lord. it's no wonder they flourished <laughs> that's right exactly so in, even in dry years obviously they, they can still they're still breeding what have you they actually part of the problem I mean, there's a number of different factors of the problem here, but they can live up to 50 years old in the wild, wow. and they can breed for 30 of those years of their <laughs> life. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why no there's... there's so many of the buggers. Exactly, that's why there's a million of them out there. They can also um, travel up to about 70 kilometres a day, so that's about 43 miles, wow. in search of food and water. So they can travel vast distances um, to, to, to find the things that they need. Yeah. And they um, there's rel- relative, there's, no, there are very few diseases... And there's no natural predators. Can you imagine anything attacking a camel? Yeah. Even in Australia, there's nothing Even, brave yeah. enough to bring yes. down a camel. I reckon the crocodile's going, yeah, nah, mate. All right. Yeah, it would take a very brave crocodile. <laughs> it really would. I'm going to go and attack something a bit simpler. To be honest yeah. with you. That's far too big. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the female cows, camels are called cows, and they can give birth. So obviously they can they can they, they can breed for thirty years, and they can breed and um, they can give birth to a single calf every two years. So the the wonder the bloody population expanded so dramatically yeah, yeah. and because it's so dramatic and so 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 many of them now they're actually considered i say um to be a feral species and um, which means that they were domesticated animals uh, but they're now obviously either escaped or they have been released which is the case for these camels into into the wild um and so they're now considered to be an invasive pest um and feral <laughs> so Jeez. joy um <laughs> Obviously, this has become now a serious problem. Really. Yeah, what the hell do you do with, with well, two 1.2 million camels or over a million camels? What the hell do you do to deal with that? Well, the Australian government decided to shoot them. <laughs> That's basically what they've decided is the best thing to do. Um, between 2009 2013, they um, had a cull. And that resulted in roughly 160,000 camels being killed. Now, I don't know exactly how they did this, but the distances are so vast that they must have been using helicopters. Basically fly around, um, find a, uh, I don't know what you call them, a group of camels, a herd of camels, a herd probably, yeah. a herd of camels and then shoot them. They killed 160,000 um, between 20, 2009 and 2013. And they think that the population then reduced to about 300,000. So between between 2013 and, and now, 2020, they reckon that obviously that they've bred by at least 700,000, and, and you know, there's now 700,000 more animals. Yikes. <laughs> it's pretty bonkers, really. <laughs> they've got a serious issue on their hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions, which I think is like a think tank, is basically... Believe, um, is worked out that their numbers are increasing by 8% a year. So within 10 years, less than 10 years, they're going to have a doubling of the population every 10 years. Okay. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And and so there's been a drought. Um, actually, there's a drought. I lived in Australia for a little while and there was a drought when I was out there in 2008 and uh, for a few years. And now there's a drought again now. And because of that, the camels are actually um, ranging a lot further into places where humans are and obviously fighting or competing for food um, with the uh, the other animals that are the, the sort of herds of cattle and sheep that the, the farmers are keeping yeah. so causing real problems obviously even more so than, than just being invasive and being in the outback in the middle of nowhere yeah no uh, <laughs> absolutely so a thirsty camel can act a thirsty adult camel can drink up to 200 liters in three minutes <laughs> So they, they wipe three out those minutes. water Yeah, yeah, three minutes. They wipe out those water sources. Give out a herd of them. They wipe out those water sources in, in like a short amount of time. Which obviously the knock on effect is the cattle have nothing to drink. Yeah, it's pretty pretty <laughs> awful. And 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 apparently they um they don't notice the, the fences that the farmers put up. because obviously 
you know, from a cam, camel, it's obviously quite high. Its neck is, you know, quite it's quite high up in the air, so it's not looking down, and it yeah. doesn't notice these fences. That the, the, the I mean, it's probably quite they've got to be quite strong fences because they're keeping cattle in, um, but they just walk straight through these fences. <laughs> so, so not only are they drinking all the farmers' water, they're destroying his fences when they come murdering, you know, murdering like a whole a whole herd of yeah. them coming through. Yeah, so so they and, they trample over the fences and the cows get out and then they drink all the water and mm-hmm, bugger off. Yep, yep. And so then if the farmer shoots, obviously say they've got a herd of drinking the water and they, they know it's happening in real time, they get the gun and, and start shooting them. They've got the problem with these dead camels are now going to decompose into their water source and contaminate it. And they've, or they've got to try and drag them away. So what? I mean, it's just it's yeah hellish. Well, yeah. What the hell do you do with a dead camel? Like, <laughs> that can't be an easy thing to move. I would I would say no, absolutely. And, and, and not only just one dead camel, you've shot a load of them. There's a herd of them drinking your water. Then you've got to drag them away. Um, yeah, it must be very difficult to deal with. Um, Jeez. Yeah, but not only that. I mean, obviously they're, they're they're bad in that way. But can you imagine? I mean, say deer in, in a lot of countries are a problem. If you run into a deer in your car, then yeah. you know it's fatal. It can be very much. You know, it comes into the windscreen and kills the occupants of the car. Can you yeah. Imagine running into a camel in the outback. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not even notice. You can't no, exactly. You just, just, just steps. You know, you hit it. You bounce off, and your car's totaled. You're dead, and you're, the camel walks off. Not one camel just shrugs fly and <laughs> Incredible, yeah, absolutely. But, but obviously, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've realised I've you know, put painted camels in quite a bad light. So let me finish on a bit of a lighter note. There's actually when when um, the camels were opening up uh, the outback, um, that they had Afghan sort of herders. Uh, I guess the herders that were helping them, you know, helping the Australians because they could deal with the camels. They were very skilled in doing that, so they yeah. brought the Afghans in. I and can't imagine actually... there were too many volunteers to do that job. <laughs> no, no. You imagine the heat and the flies. And yeah. the camels. Oh no, I can't. And the head biting. Job. Yeah, the head, the head bite. Yeah, the ag- aggressive camels. Yeah, no, no, not not for me. <laughs> I, I I definitely wouldn't do that job. So they they basically brought these Afghans in, and so there's now once the country was opened up they also built, also built railway lines and there's a train service that goes north-south through the whole of Australia so um, from Adelaide in South Australia through Alice Springs and then into Darwin in the Northern Territory um, and it was originally dubbed the Afghan Express after these Afghanis who would come across um, with the camels I guess they would come across the camels they came from Tenerife but anyway they would come to sort of manage these camels um, from the 1860s onwards uh, and they would they, so they, they named this um, railway line after the Afghans uh, Afghan <laughs> Express and now being that it's Australia and they shorten everything, put no on it generally, or a yeah. Y or a whatever, <laughs> um, they, they've called they now renamed the Afghan Express to the GAN. And you can take this train either from the Northern Territory or from South Australia, and you can take it. It takes two days to go the full length of the country, um, north to south or south to north, and it's called the Gans, which is pretty interesting. Um, based on based on, we well, didn't call it the Camel, I suppose. You know, it's pretty, <laughs> good, it's pretty good thing, really. And one thing to one one final thing to end on: if you ever visit Australia and you go and see one of the most iconic animals, the kangaroo, obviously well known in um, Australia, uh, you may may well see it in, in in a zoo or perhaps in the outback. Um, you've got to. It's good to remember that there are over one hundred times as many camels in the Australian desert than there are are kangaroos yes yeah so maybe they should change the standards with the, with, <laughs> yeah. the, with, the, with the kangaroo and maybe put a camel on there instead it's i just have the, uh, the image of like people just looking out over thousands and thousands of camels and kind of shrugging and going ah someone else can deal with that <laughs> yeah yeah not my problem mate <laughs> yeah. that's amazing where did you get all that information from uh of various sources um some government web pages in, in australia and i will definitely link those on our web our website uh, we love the internet.co.uk that's amazing. It kind of reminds me of the emu war. Have you come across the emu war? I I recognise the term. I don't know. Is, was it South Africa? Uh, no, it was it was Australia as well. Oh, was it? And it was, okay. It was basically like a, a similar kind of thing. They were trying to cull emus because um, they were running a mock in the so in many invasive species. Yeah, yeah, basically exactly the same thing. Um, and the the government put a bounty on uh, on emus, um, oh. and for anyone who came out, they could and. and killed an emu and presented it they could claim a bounty on it right and they just they sent i think they sent the army in at one point and they had like, <laughs> guys with machine guns chasing after these emus but they were just running away <laughs> just running the away army. running away yeah wow. they, yeah yeah uh, and it was well, i think they were relatively new to using machine guns so maybe weren't doing very well <laughs> But yes, they 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 charged in and they they used a whole load of bullets and a whole load of people, uh, and completely failed to really <laughs> deal with the problem. <laughs> the yeah. emus proved to be significantly hardier than they than they were expecting. <laughs> Who'd have thought humans could lose against emus? Yes, well, apparently, apparently, so far it's one nil in the uh, humans and emus wars. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Emu War 2 to be coming soon. Actually, emus and, and um, kangaroos are actually the, the, the animals on the crest of the Australian crest. So oh, they're trying oh. to murder them. <laughs> well, they've clearly got over emus. the emu problem. <laughs> Amazing. Oh dear. Yeah, I think the. Uh, I'm just looking at it on Wikipedia here. In 1950, uh, Hugh Leslie raised the issue of emus in federal parliament and mm. urged the army minister to release ammunition for the army to use, um, to, to give to farmers to use. And they released <laughs> half a million rounds of ammunition to give to the farmers. Wow. Yeah, they were taking it seriously. They really were. They do take their culling seriously in Australia. The trouble is they have so many invasive species. Obviously, maybe they'll do that in another episode. But they do have a lot of invasive species that are causing serious problems in the country. Yeah. Humans. Well, there we go. Camels camels in Australia. Who knew? (laughs) God bless the internet, eh? That's what we say. If you have anything to add from the uh, Camel Wars or the Hippo Wars, <laughs> please uh, <laughs> let us know. You can find contact information on our website. Uh, you can find us on Twitter uh, and then suggest topics or talk about things that you've learnt from going down the various Wikipedia rabbit holes that we've been on as well. Yeah, we'd love to hear. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>